Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 864. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 25th, 2024. All right, welcome to probably the most watched episode of this year. I'm going way on the limb here and tell you that most people are going to want to watch this because people are interested in what we think about lots of topics, and we have lots of good topics. The first topic, of course, will be the new Archbishop of the ACNA. But before we get there, George, how you doing? How is life uh, treating you in Florida? A, uh, it's yeah. been a busy week. It's been a hot week. Uh, but uh, the news is just coming fast and furious, and uh, yeah. I'm just enjoying my time. <laughs> I'm watching uh, uh, Jeff Walton's Twitter feed from uh, the ACNA right now, and a lot is happening uh, that we'll get to talk about. I'm here in Idaho for another couple of days, and we head over to Yellowstone, which will be a lot of fun. So uh, we have not had the heat wave you had yet. Uh, I think today, last yesterday was uh, 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, what are you doing down there in Florida? Oh, it's in the mid '90s, but uh, I'm used to it. I like it myself. <laughs> you do. You're not wearing your wool suit, so th that's good. All right, let's move on to the news. Our first story is the ACNA has chosen a new leader, a new archbishop. Let me pull up my show notes. Um, they met in the crypt, and um, let's just talk about the crypt. If you've not been to uh, this church in Latrobe, they have a crypt in the basement, but the crypt is not air conditioned. And George and I know what that, that feels like, don't we? Right now, I, I turned off the AC here uh, in Sasquatch uh, for the next hour so that you don't hear the background noise. And it's starting to get uncomfortable already. I, I, I feel a little beads of sweat here. I can't imagine being in a crypt in a church uh, for hours a day trying to choose the next archbishop. Is that the report you've heard too, George? Yes, the crypt is the basement of the chapel of St. Vincent's College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. It's where the, arch where the bishops met. They were uh, sequestered in that room, and they were not given, they're not allowed to have any digital devices, and they're all supposed to dress up in their cassocks and look uh, Episcopal. So in a room with no air conditioning, most of them have wool cassocks, and they're locked in there essentially all Friday night, all day Saturday, and all day mm -hmm. Sunday. So they came to a decision by Saturday afternoon. I don't think they wanted to take it to Sunday. Okay. And so they elected you need... Steve Wood. Yeah, and Steve Wood. Final, and, and it was after all the voting. Uh, we don't know who the candidates were. We'll find out over the course of time, but we'll, let's focus on Steve Wood today. Mm -hmm. The final vote was unanimous. All the bishops there at the last vote gave him unanimity of support. Okay. Steve Wood, uh, Bishop of the Diocese of the Carolinas, uh, over in uh, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, across the bridge from Charleston. If you've never been there, it's a beautiful church. They had a fire uh, several years ago that uh, gutted the church, but they rebuilt. Uh, Steve Wood himself uh, is probably one of the great survivors of COVID. He, had, he was in intensive care for about a month and uh, received treatment for COVID, and uh, he was intubated, and he survived. Uh, he's got a great story, and uh, one of his great stories is the leadership he pro provides his church and his diocese. Now, we're going to get really into the weeds about picking an archbishop in this discussion, but let's focus a little bit on uh, kind of the main issues that Steve Wood is going to have to face now that he's the uh, starting Friday, the new archbishop of the ACNA, George. Topic one, I got to say, I said it before, is going to be non-geographical dioceses. And if there is not a poster child for uh, non-geographical dioceses, it's the Carolinas, where he, Di where he's Diocese a bishop. of the Carolinas overlaps, yeah. uh, I believe it's one six. of six dioceses yeah. in, in that area that overlap. And the ACNA, in principle, has decided that we really need to get away from affinity dioceses and move towards geographic, the traditional understanding of a diocese. Well, you've got the Diocese of South Carolina, you've got the Diocese of the Southeast of the Reformed Episcopal Church, you've got uh, C4SO, you've got the Diocese of the Carolinas, you've got uh, Steve Breedloves, so uh, what's that diocese called? Um, uh, well, you've got his yeah, diocese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the, the, the point, and I think you've got some parishes of the diocese of the South, Foley Beach's diocese, all in, these, in this general area. And will 
uh, will he will he work towards eliminating these overlapping jurisdictions, merging his diocese into South Carolina, for instance, or South Carolina into his diocese, for whatever, whatever you, however you wish to describe it, or will there be a press for uh, keeping people's uh, territories and integrities intact as they are? Now, some people say that you must have these affinity dioceses to allow people to differ on the issues of women's orders and other things. Now, um, that is a good argument, but the stronger argument, uh, in my belief, is that uh, you know the bishop should have a geographic see. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think it is ultimately unprofitable for the health of the church to divide along these uh, sectarian lines in uh, Episcopal oversight. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously back in 2008 and nine to gather all the kittens in the kitten box together, uh, certain uh, deals had to be made. Back then we had the AMIE uh, and other uh, outskirts, the RC that, that were coming in, and we said we'll have non-geographical, I can't even talk, non-geographical diocese for a time. Well, I think that time has come. You know, it's time to uh, be a mature church, show your maturity, and uh, deal with this in a a, a nation building way. So now, one of the things that as the new primate, Steve Woodle, have to deal with the Nigerians very closely, mm -hmm. and the Nigerians have given up their American diocese. They, uh, Felix Orgy's diocese is fully into the ACNA. Mm -hmm. And those that remained are missionary districts. They're not dioceses anymore, the Anglo the Church of Nigeria in North America. And so if Steve Woods joins the side that we have to preserve these diocesan integrities, you're basically sticking your finger in the eye of the Church of Nigeria, which agreed to the argument that we need to get away from these affinity dioceses. And in their case, people of Nigerian extraction wanted to have dioceses run and set up and under Nigeria. Well, Felix Orgy has a multiracial, multilingual, multi-ethnic diocese uh, that came out of Nigeria, but is now fully part of the ACNA. That's the future, mm -hmm. not not uh, sort of keeping uh, keeping your trophies, if you will. Um, that's that's the, that's the healthy mature future of course so well let's talk about that that one elephant in the room issue uh you and i had predictions in the last conclave we thought we knew who the top three or four candidates were going into this uh election we knew who the top three or four or uh, maybe five candidates were you know we, we pegged it right off the top and so Imagine my surprise back in 2014 when out stumbles uh, from from the, the crypt, uh, the conclave, Archbishop Foley. He walks over to Kevin and puts my hand, his hands on my shoulders, says, "Kevin, they just elected me Archbishop. Pray for me." <laughs> I said, "What? Well, I that can't be. You weren't on my list. You were not on my list of candidates. There's no way you're Archbishop." Well, Steve Wood was not on my list of candidates, George. And so, I, because in of, our private, yeah, in our private back and forth, I, I touted Eric Meniz, mm -hmm. and I think you thought, uh, oh, the, the Dobbs. Uh, light of uh, Julian Dobbs, yeah, was your your pick, and it's not that they, you know, are so far superior, but I just thought looking at the different mix, sure, and one of the things you know that Bob Duncan was for women, orders. Mm -hmm. Foley Beach was against women orders. Eric Meniz was against women's orders, as are the majority of the bishops, I think. But maybe this pendulum swung back because Stuart Woods, Steve, Steve Woods, excuse Steve, me, yeah. Steve Woods has women priests in his diocese. Now, modify it. He modify doesn't it. allow them to be rectors. Yes. He doesn't allow them to be rectors, they're assistants, but he has mm -hmm. women clergy. Uh, he sort of follows the John Stott line that they may not exercise headship, um, which is a way to piss everybody off. That those who are against women, that's a step too far, and those who are for it, that's not enough. Well, I it so was I, five... I, I didn't I didn't think that was going to be, happen, but yep, there you go. I kind of predicted five episodes ago that uh, they would do this little pendulum 
where uh, you know Duncan was obviously pro wins orders, fully uh, did not endorse women's orders, and the next one again would be uh, pro women's orders to some degree. Uh, that prediction seems to come to light because uh, does not the Archbishop of Canterbury go from theologically based to evangelical based every uh, round or two? You know, there's just this desire to to keep that pendulum swinging, to keep everybody happy. Uh, now, if you watch yeah, Facebook I mean, or see. Twitter, not everybody's happy, but uh, that's just less life. Well, yeah, you know? like Carrie was evangelical and Williams mm -hmm. was more of a Catholic and then... Mm -hmm. Uh, Justin Welby is considered more of an evangelical. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've seen that in other places where it swings sort of between there's no hard and fast rule to that effect, but mm -hmm. sometimes it just works out that way. Who now, should I complain? Oh, George, who should I complain to if I'm not happy that they elected a archbishop who is pro women's orders? Facebook, that's who you complain to. No, you should and, complain to your bishop because your bishop voted for this person. That's yeah. right. Everybody at the end gave him unanimous support. Yeah. Now here, here's the uh, here's the kicker. Uh, he had a ha he had a honeymoon that lasted about a half hour because on Facebook all the crazies came out. No, yeah. Well, that's uncommon. Uh, it it wasn't the crazies, out, but yeah, people came out expressing their disappointment uh, sooner than their joy at his election. Because those who were heavily invested in one particular position really felt a high degree of, uh, I don't want to say anger, but they were disappointed because somebody who was not on side uh, came out on top. Now I have come down and we've seen support yeah. from him since then. And some people have taken down their harsher criticisms. I have spent uh, most of my adult life in church leadership as a uh, in the vestry either senior warden or junior warden or church planter or or treasurer uh albeit for the last five years where i've just i'm done okay i, I i'm moving on in my role here in the polity of the church i shouldn't be in in working in a church but my biggest uh observation over those 25 30 years in church leadership was the um seminaries do not teach clergy business skills leadership skills in running a church admin skills none whatsoever so when you run into people who have admin skills you're like i know yeah he's got it uh i remember meeting uh paul donaldson uh in canada boom he's got that leadership skill i remember meeting archbishop duncan for the first time he's got it well, he didn't get that at seminary. Where did he get that from? So in in my travels, I get to meet people who actually have this thing that's been lacking from many of the clergy I've served under. I think, in my understanding and, and knowledge of Steve Wood, he has that leadership that the ACNA is looking for. And we can't always point to the choices. It has to be the elephant in the room when it orders. It has to be the geographical. No, right now, uh, if, if the ACNA is mature, it has to be able to pick somebody who's going to be a good leader and who's going to represent the entire church. And I think they may have found it in him. Now, uh, we don't know yet. That's what I think the transcript is for. We'll, we'll cover it for the next 10 years. But that's my, my assumption here is that uh, they picked a guy who led his church well, who dealt with crises in his own life and in his church and in the diocese well, and maybe this is a good step forward for the ACNA and its third Archbishop George. Yes, and from my perspective, I think on the international scene, this is might be a very good choice. Mm -hmm. Because right now, the GAFCON and Global South Fellowship, basically everybody's dead in the water. There's a lack of effective leadership at the very top, in my opinion. And maybe Steve Woods is the man to energize. And, uh, you know, sometimes the man, you know, Peter Akinola and Henry Arambe were the right men at the right time. Mm -hmm. And before that, you wouldn't have thought so. But then they stepped into their roles and they just ran with it. And we have seen the results. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is God's raising up someone who wasn't really on our radars from a domestic, you know, whose turn is it perspective. 
but whom God is going to use to basically have a come to Jesus moment for the leaders of the conservative wings of the Anglican churches that we need to all talk from the same, sing from the same song sheet. And this is how this plays out in, in true leadership. I uh, was always invited to the Forward in Faith North America uh, gatherings that uh, happened in around St. Louis and other places throughout the years. And I'd show up there the videotape and, and provide a, a live stream for them. And every year, Archbishop Duncan would show up, who is, uh, you know, obviously pro women's orders, but he would give them updates on, on their fight within the College of Bishops and talk about how their message as Forward in Faith and and women's orders is is being dealt with at the church level and he was very honest and forthright and they really appreciated that in the same way um uh, archbishop foley uh, spoke to groups who were pro women's orders uh, in the same loving way uh representing the whole church and that's what we expect that steve would be also represent the entire church because if you check out the ac and a canons and bylaws and uh, constitution women's orders is in there you know this isn't something new it's been there for a while and this will have to be dealt with at a uh, college of bishops level not at a uh, uh, archbishop level now there is a small fly in the ointment here and that steve wood went a little overboard during the george floyd era we all did some of <laughs> well some of his public <laughs> pronouncements about systematic racism Kevin, when you interview him, I'd like you to ask him, does he still stand on his position of three sure. years ago? Because um, when, when I interview him, I, much. okay, here's how it works. Okay, I have requested an interview with the, the Archbishop to be uh, starting Friday. Uh, uh, Steve Wood, we'll see if that happens. I know I'm the first person to request an interview. I'd be shocked if anybody else got one uh, or disappointed, not just shocked. Uh, uh, please, uh, AC and I, AC and A uh, headquarters, reach out to me. Let me know when you get a time. My schedule's free. When yeah, so back to when when I interview Steve Woods, you want me to talk about what again? George Floyd and systematic yeah. racism. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's a big topic because uh, our country forgot who we were. Uh, right after that, we forgot what unified us, what made us strong. Uh, and all we pointed to was what divided us, and we called everything racist. And so, yeah, I, I would sure love to talk to people uh, in charge of a church about that. Let's move on to some other news. Um, George, we didn't talk about this in the show notes. I'm going to surprise you with this, but this is the second anniversary of the end of Roe v. Wade. Did that end an abortion in America? No, it did not. Did that end the abortion industry? No. Did that uh, and the uh, uh, Eucharistic pagan cult called abortion? No, but it's a step in the right direction. You yeah, know, it moved the it moved the issue off the national stage because it's now a state issue. Yes, I believe there's 17 states that restrict abortion almost up to the point of birth. Florida, I believe, is uh, no abortion after six weeks. Right. And then there's states like uh, Vermont and California that have abort, uh, New York have abortion up to the moment of birth. And that pushing it down to the state level is, I believe actually from a democracy point of view, a better way to do it because it allows local politics to determine this issue. Um, no, there will be people who want to have an absolute ban and an absolute uh, openness to this on both sides. Um, that's never really going to happen in a uh, political environment where we have give and take. Well, I think to allow the states to decide. I think is the best way forward. It's it now a constitution. It's now a states issue. Uh, Ruth uh, Gator Ginsburg uh, said that this is. Did I pronounce that right, Ruth? Well, whatever. You uh, said that this is a bad law and it would eventually be overturned. She was right. Um, and but in as such, this will still be a national topic and especially in, in presidential politics. People uh, who are uh, on this are gonna blame Trump, uh, you know, for, for uh, st uh, stacking the Supreme Court with people who really believe. But, um, you know. Well, Trump's, Trump's answer is, it's got nothing to do with me, it's a state mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a good argument because he promised, he did what he said he would do, which is 
help get Roe versus Wade overturned by putting in judges that respect the law, not ideologues. And when by part, what impartial judges viewed this, it was tossed out. So, you know, Trump will be attacked by people who want abortion on demand everywhere at any time in any place. And then he will be attacked by those who want an absolute prohibition at any time in any place. Mm -hmm. But his response is going to be, it's not a federal issue anymore. And his he's not making any decision on this point. Yeah. He's turned it over to the states. So let's move on and talk about the fat lady singing in Louisville, Kentucky this week. General Convention is meeting, and uh, boy, if you're watching Twitter, Facebook, and all the press reports that are coming out from the bishops, it ain't pretty. They're arguing about money, George, not theology. Hmm. They're arguing about money and uh, power. The uh, General Convention officially started yesterday, Monday. They had he committee hearings beforehand. And how general convention works is that committees bring resolutions to the floor. They either start the House of Bishops, the House of Deputies, and one house votes that up and down. If it's voted down, it dies. If it's voted up, it goes to the other house for either amendment or approval. And so we've not really had any final work because we're still in that initial stage. But what we're seeing is fighting over power. There was a resolution brought forward by six dioceses uh, to reduce by 2030, I believe it was, the asking from the national church for the diocese down to 10%. It's currently at 15, it had been at 19. And the argument was that money spent on the national level is inefficient and it doesn't go to, it doesn't provide a return in growth and opportunity and evangelism. Well, this was vociferously, vociferously, uh, <laughs> you got it, you got it. To yeah. by the deputies in general convention who believe that general convention is the sole heart and mind of the church. One uh, member of the executive council says here, where your heart is, your treasure will be also, and we should make our heart the general convention because any money spent by the general convention is much more efficiently spent than money in the parish, which is absolute utter nonsense. Yeah, it's horrible, yeah. And so what we and so this was rejected by the deputies who want to control things. Well, the bishops who are pushing for uh, a leaner Episcopal Church budget have taken a knife to a number of uh, pet projects. A half million dollars for a hymnal supplement was just you know eviscerated. No, no money for that. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a uh, hymnal revision to look at our colonial racist misogynistic roots and all that was knocked down to like ten thousand dollars and things some and because the, the bishops are saying this is a waste of money this is just money just being thrown away that doesn't achieve anything people will write a report that no one will pay any attention to and if you want music you can there's nobody so dumb that they can't find music you don't need these supplements or whatnot. So the, the, the fighting is over shrinking the general convention's budget uh, or keeping the power and giving more power to the dioceses and parishes to allocate resources or keeping the power in the general convention. And so that's where the fight's coming down. Um, and we'll see how this week ends, but uh, it's been a difficult week. We've had, we have an election for a new president in the House of Deputies, and the election turned nasty. There are three candidates running. Uh, it's almost like a South Park joke. Uh, it's, uh, three women, yeah. An African-American, <laughs> a Hispanic-American, and a woman of Native American ancestry. Uh, three crazy women uh, who blame the patriarchy. Well, the current president is Hispanic, and the current vice president is running against her. She's the Indian-American. She put out a blog post attacking the president for being incompetent and forcing her to clean up all the messes that she's made as president. And the president responded, you know, in kind that, no, I'm not incompetent, you're incompetent, and you're disloyal and ungrateful and this and that and the other. So that the fights, and then the black union of black Episcopal, or the deputies of color. Color, yes. <laughs> I, I, whether I, as a pink deputy, would, if I were a deputy, would I be a deputy of a pink color? Or I don't know. They've all come down for the, you know, tribal vote. Let's all vote for the black person because we're black. 
it's just silliness and so we'll just see what happens that the uh, it's it's getting nasty and personal the vote on the presiding bishop would be tomorrow and not i haven't heard any buzz to change my prediction that it'll be gutierrez um the only person hurt by the revelations of title four investigations were the woman running dd duncan probe because she was the only one who she, where the title four was that she had done something wrong which was inflate her resume academically whereas the other two were uh attacked for basically clamping down on something bad in their diocese and being too harsh which is not a dis which is not a disqualifier no so i still think gutierrez is the one and because no real groundswell has risen for any of the others um, i wonder if you if you went to the press room if you would find cnn there or no, npr the, the, or AP, no. or Reuters, or Anglican no, I, TV, I, the one of the greats. Um, I'm, I'm accredited to this convention. Right. Uh, I've been accredited as a journalist to every convention since 19... You, you could stop at 19, that's a long time. <laughs> 1993? Yeah. Or 95, or 96, well, long time ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been, you know, eight or nine of them. Uh, no, actually 10 of them. And I haven't, I don't need to go anymore because it's all live stream. So, and the, uh, if when you're there, uh, it's very controlled, very manipulated. And basically all of my sources have either retired or been kicked out of the Episcopal church. So I don't really have the access I one had, once had, but I can remember Kevin in Minnesota where we had, yeah, Christiana, uh, not Chris, we had one of the CNN, uh, babes uh, yeah well, she she was in columbus truck. too yeah, yeah we had in the Col in columbus had all the trucks everybody was there all the satellite trucks all the uh um news people were there everybody was asking questions what's an episcopal person what does episcopal mean you know all the good questions <laughs> and it, it's going from that to then like the next few years places like the washington post asked me to cover for them mm -hmm. and now if the Washington Post or the New York Times has an article, it won't be because one of their people are there, yeah. but because the local Louisville, Kentucky AP reporter showed up that afternoon, or they'll take it off of uh, uh, from the religion news service. People don't, church news is just not a thing anymore in the old media. Mm. Uh, there's plenty of coverage in the new media, but for instance, we, Anglican Inc., we've made the decision not to do a gavel-to-gavel, blow-by-blow, basically report in the end what happens because people really aren't interested in the sausage-making anymore. It will not be a big story, no matter what we post. You know, it'll be one of those 600 views instead of, you know, 6,000. Uh, the ACNA stories will be real big uh, because it's, uh, it's still a growing church, and uh, they have elephants in the room. There's no elephants in the Episcopal Church anymore. They're gone. You know, they, they were starved out. They were they were butchered. They butchered that elephant. You know, so. Well, the the real story, if I were to say at General Convention, is that nobody's talking about the decline of the Episcopal Church and taking steps to positively address it. Yes, each of the candidates for presiding bishop gave their vision for the future. Mm -hmm. But essentially, it's more of the same with a bit of tweaking here and tweaking there. No root and branch reform is being envisioned uh, to change the trajectory of decline and uh, death. There are some pleasant things. They're going to be adopting a live and let live resolution, which is they will tolerate the George Congers of this world if George Conger will tolerate the Gene Robinsons of this world since I have no authority over anybody, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the point being that you, you'll no longer be uh, persecuted for having a different theological opinion. Now, that's a wonderful thing, but the problem is it's only as good as the bishop. If you have a horrible bishop like Charles Benison, who will uh, persecute anybody who disagrees with him, I'm sorry, the General Convention pass all the resolutions they want, it won't matter. So it's only, it's only as good as the bishops, and the purge will continue. And they'll just, instead of saying, well, we won't allow you to be called to this diocese anymore because you're conservative, instead they'll say, well, we think we need a, uh, a black woman for this job. And, you know, the, the, 
these people aren't stupid. They're, they're ways to get around uh, overt discrimination and get what you want. There are, but, but at least they're, uh, but at least they're making the public nod that we need to end the fratricide of killing each other. Finally, but they still have lost the cause. You know, they hired for the last their presiding bishop a man who believes in revivals and will preach about love and revival you know, until his skin falls off. But he doesn't know what it means. And if you don't know what a revival is and you don't know what your church is and who Jesus is, um, you're still going to have people leaving the pews, exiting the doors and looking for something else. And where, where, where they're going? Well, uh, they're, they're some, I would say most aren't going anywhere right now. Some will go to the ACNA, some will go to the Roman Catholic Church, some will join the Lutherans, uh, the Methodists are still a mess. And, but every year, where, where are those 20% of people going? You know? Well, I don't think they're going, I don't, I think the days of mass exodus are gone because mm -hmm. nobody's left my church except by death or moving. <laughs> uh, I've had, you know, out of 400 bodies, maybe four or five people leave because they thought I was too conservative and four or five people leave because they thought I was too liberal, mm -hmm. but they're not going anywhere else. Um, they're not going to other denominations. In other words, I, th I think the reality on the ground is, well, where we are in Florida, uh, where new, new land, new territory, nobody's here multi-generations. So grandpa isn't buried in the cemetery. Therefore no. I have to stay to the end, but rather it's a consumer's market and people will go where they like the preaching, they like the fellowship, they like the friendship. And so we have, I would say a third of my congregation were, are Roman Catholics. Um, we have people who in the winter, in the summer, are Roman Catholics up in Connecticut, and in the winter are Episcopalians uh, from November to May because they find themselves fed spiritually in this congregation. So I just don't think this denominational business is uh, the future. We shall see. Let's move on to some more stories here. Um, got some interesting ones here. Let's cover the Church of England. General Synod is on the horizon. Obviously, they're talking about living love and faith, and they'll talk a little bit about distrust within the Church of England. Um, they're blaming social media. I'm blaming scripture. You decide. Yeah, the Bishop of uh, Ipswich and St. Edmundsbury uh, yeah. shared a, a group that put together a report, one, one of the pre synod papers, which did a study and found that there's pervasive distrust within the Church of England. And it said the culprit was social media and that people were dividing along tribal lines, on class line, that the church was more splintered than it had ever been before. And they put the blame solely on social media not solely, but the good portion of it on yeah. social media. I don't think that's fair to social media because it's like saying guns kill people. No, people kill people using guns. People use social media to attack anonymously or troll or, you know, vi vilify people. The instrument they use is social media. So in that respect, yes, it's true. But, you know, when you have the Jane Ozans saying that, you know, anybody who doesn't believe as she does should be driven out of the Church of England. And then you have the uh, hard right people who every third person is a heretic or a this and that and the other. Um, it's entertaining to read, but it doesn't provide for an erratic uh, place. Well, uh, I but I would say... I distrust is the leadership failure myself. Yeah, leadership, but also the failure of mutual flourishing. You know, something that was promised that we can all work uh, in the same camp and have different opinions on women's orders. And now we're finally getting to the point where they're thinking about kicking out uh, one side. Mutual flourishing died. It was never really uh, a fair argument. And the future was always going to be women's orders. Mm -hmm. um, no, matter what, no, no matter what you thought or how safe you thought you were. I'm sorry, I'm bumping my desk here. There we go. <laughs> and so, you know, it, when you see major uh, things like that fall apart, of course there's going to be distrust. 
if you find out oh, that Irby, Irby of the Week, uh, Justin will be speaking something different on LLF or on uh, Same Sex Blessings or, uh, you know, he, he gives a different message to a different crowd. Yeah, well, who do we trust? Yeah. Well, safeguarding that fiasco has yeah. taken a tremendous toll that um, just in the uh, 90s, the Roman Catholic clergy abuse scandal, I can remember people looking at me cross-eyed because I had a clergy collar on thinking I was a Catholic priest and they were hiding their children from me because the hysteria about pervert Catholic priests was so bad. Now the Catholic Church did step in and put in a no, you know, no tolerance, no, they cleaned up their act. It took some while, but they eventually cleaned up their act and they, that scandal's by and large not done with. Church of England has never addressed this head on and so it's allowing the scandal to fester and so the safeguarding fiascos of not owning up to or taking responsibility or offering pastoral support to people who are abused by clergy and church workers i i can beat that i got i got still there i got one better taking away the right to officiate of a former archbishop of canterbury that would do it <laughs> just like i could go uh, we had at one point just a controversy a month coming out of justin Wobby. And so, yeah, the, where would the trust be? Who would trust anything going on over there, George? You know? Well, that's the hard thing because we're called to trust and we're called to look and seek the best in other people. Hmm. But experience also tells us, you know, once bit, twice shy. And I hate to say it, but people have been bitten so many times by the hierarchy, by the bishops, the archdeacons, the dean. The leadership is out. The, the impression that is given is that the leadership is out for institutional preservation uh, and forget the people in the pew, forget the parish priest. And when you push that agenda, how can anybody trust you? Yeah, I agree. All right, moving on to our next story. We reported last week on what happened with the Global South. Uh, in fact, the title was What Happened in Cairo, was the title of last week's episode. Uh, we were pretty thorough, and uh, we brought up some pros and cons about it. Uh, I got three or four emails from people who were there, nailed it, you understood, you got it right. However, some people at GAFCON want us to correct a few factual errors, which we are more than able to do here, because, well, we're, we're reporters, and that's what we do. George, um, we kind of said the fatal flaw was not doing more with GAFCON. That still exists, right? That was an yeah, the error. Global, some Global South people got in touch with me to say that I, I misspoke on one or two points. One was mm -hmm. that Anthony Pogo, the uh, Anglican Consultative Council General Secretary, was given a platform. He was present as a guest, but he did not speak. Mm -hmm. So he was not given a platform. He was just given an invitation. So I need to correct that mistake I made. Um, some people were disappointed by my uh, analysis of Justin Body Rama, as I inferred that he was not up to the task compared to past leaders of the Global South. That's uh, that's an opinion. It's not a fact that you can prove or disprove. Mm -hmm. But what is, I think, talking to people who understand Africa and the African way of doing things and reading documents from an African perspective, this final document would be read one way by a European or an American mind. Some English people came away very encouraged by this document. Some Americans came away very encouraged by this document. Some Africans are saying, oh, this is just, this is just uh, polite noises. Nothing's going to happen. So we've, I've, so now, do I know which way to interpret this from an African perspective where this is polite noises and this is just that GAFCON and Global South are so divided that they're just making nice right now? Or was this a breakthrough? Only time will tell. My gut instinct and my talking to people and my sort of, my sense of having done this for 30 years is that the division between GAFCON and the Global South has not been healed. They're not walking side by side. They're walking in the same direction, but there are different paces and they're different courses. And GAFCON has decided that they're done with the Canterbury system. Global South, many of its leaders are still 
tied to the Canterbury centric worldview. And those two are incompatible. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and but that was... until they speak with a common mind about what they see as the future, we're not going to see Rwanda and Nigeria fully invested in the global south, mm -hmm. nor will Singapore and um, Tanzania be fully invested in GAFCON until everybody speaks with a common mind. Everybody in the global south meeting admitted and knows that there is no leadership coming from Canterbury. They said in so much that uh, Canterbury has forfeited its role as leader of the Anglican Communion. The Anglican Communion right now is rudderless. There's nobody at the helm. And this was a great chance to fill that void. And they didn't. Uh, they, they didn't yep. fill that void in any way, shape, or form. And the church needed that. The church right now wants a leader. And they want somebody to finally step back and, and take the microphone and say, okay, I, it is me. I will serve. Yeah. Gee, uh, one of the people I spoke with, an African, used the analogy of the call of Samuel. Mm. Eli the priests. Eli was old. Sure. His time was yeah. done. And his sons were worthless. And Samuel, the young boy, was called to be the priest uh, in replacement of, of Eli. And what some of the Africans were waiting for was somebody to say, here I am, Lord, uh, answering that call. And nobody did that at this meeting. Maybe the call wasn't issued to anybody at this meeting. We maybe are, maybe the way the spirit is working is we just have to be patient, which is a very hard thing to do because I know I'd like to see action now. I'm, I'm getting old, Kevin. I've been doing this for 30 years and I don't want to keep reporting for the next 20 years about stuff that, you know, that I could, re I could write the stories today and file them in 10 years because we're at the same place. Now, so maybe my frustration is pushing me in a certain place. Well, I think that our frustration comes from promises. Um, okay, my, my biggest complaint in being a reporter and an observationist and being a Christian is I have to work with other fallen people like myself. Okay, and they exist in, la in laity, they exist as priests, they exist as bishops and archbishops. We're all fallen. And uh, you are hearing Kevin's expectations here. Kevin was expecting for somebody to say up and, and, and said, we'll be the captain while the ship is at sea. Well, that's, that's all we needed. Okay, the, the, simply, you know, and, and you know what? You had the numbers to do it. You had the place, you, didn't, you wouldn't have to schedule another meeting. And all Canterbury would be doing, all Justin Welby would be doing for the next two years until he retires is responding to you, not you responding to him. And you've lost that. Well, maybe I think what we were asking for was a movement of the Holy Spirit in Cairo that was clear and unambiguous. And it didn't occur. At least I didn't see it occurring in my reading of and viewing. Mm -hmm. Others may, and and if you were there, and if you disagree strongly, let us know. Sure. Because at this stage, we can only report upon what our impressions are, and that's that's not the sum of all things. No. Well, I, we're usually right anyway. I, 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 you don't don't put us under the bus, George. Okay, uh, that's it for. Um, that type of news. Let's talk about uh, some big political news. Uh, WikiLeaks uh, editor chief Julian Assange has made a plea deal with the United States and is going to be released with time served, which is a lot this of time. Is a, this <laughs> yeah. is a big story. Mm -hmm. um, Julian Assange was the uh, editor of WikiLeaks, which basically spilled all the George H W George W Bush and Obama. Mm -hmm dirty tricks and secrets around the world mm -hmm. and you know mike pompeo when he was secretary of state wanted to assassinate julian assange and yeah. trump said no and assange has been held in prison in britain fighting extradition to the u.s uh for five, over five years yeah, more he had than initially that. Yeah. been arrested on allegations of rape in sweden mm -hmm. but the statute of limitations has passed and the Swedes are not pursuing that case since 2019. So Assange basically was fighting being brought back to the United States. And if the Secretary of State is telling people he wants you dead, 
I would fight too. Uh, Cause this is a, what's his Epstein? Uh, what was that man's name? Um, the, the Epstein fellow who died in prison. <laughs> you just say Epstein. Uh, I forget his name too. He's such a low killer. Yeah. Okay. The, that, he, but, but the Department of Justice. Worked Jeffrey. Out a plea arrangement. Jeffrey. 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 Yeah. The Department of Justice worked out a plea deal where Assange would plead guilty to one count of, under the Espionage Act. And in exchange, he would be sentenced to time served in Britain, mm -hmm. and then he'd be free to return to Australia. He's an Australian citizen. And in fact, the hearing is being held at the U.S. Federal Court for the District of the Northern Marianas Island. So Assange is flying from London to Bangkok, Bangkok to the Mariana Islands, and then from the Mariana Islands straight down to Australia. It's as far away from as Washington, D.C. as you can get where the case was initially brought, or New York, where the case initially was brought. Now, Donald Trump had been making noises that he would pardon, he would commute. Or, in other words, Donald Trump was uh, questioning the, the uh, veracity of the charges against Julian Assange and uh, that he was being persecuted by the deep state. And uh, so I'd, I'd, I'm basically shocked that the Biden administration is letting him go. Uh, yeah, because there's, there's no votes to gain here. Okay, as far as they're trying to buy off student loans to make sure they get the, the younger vote. He's out there trying to get the black vote, the Hispanic vote. There's no really an Assange vote. So I don't know what the ultimate goal here was, although to say time has passed. You know, and uh, yeah, we know from the past that the sooner you get somebody prosecuted and in jail, the sooner that, that hassle is gone. You don't have to worry about it. Julian Assange was always out there. And always had access to more leaks, and was willing and was willing to post those leaks, good or bad, uh, on the internet. And he he did. He had he had the Hillary Clinton stuff, and uh, yeah. you know he had the Hillary, but he never released it. So, you know. And the thing is that Julian Assange has been proven right all these yeah. years later. Yeah. In other words, it wasn't that he was promoting lies or was an agent of the Russians or anything like that. He was. A truth teller. He is a truth teller. And Up to a point. US I mean, except for US one. The government wanted to kill him. Yeah. Pizzagate. Pizzagate. Yeah. Okay. He, we're getting really deep. <laughs> here. Okay. He, he started the Pizzagate thing. But other than that, yes, Julian is 99% correct. Okay. Absolutely. So he's, he's got our level of uh, accuracy then, I guess. <laughs> yes, I guess so. Okay, so while we've been talking, I've had uh, uh, our friend Jeff Walton give me updates from Latrobe, and he's he's just texted me a couple that's going to be interesting for our our viewers and those people who who sat with us for forty seven minutes. I'm going to read these really quick here. A few tidbit uh, can't talk. A few tidbits regarding conclave. Most are cheery and seem in good spirit. Obviously, obvious that Julian Dobbs was one of the three finalists. Unsure who the third was. There were many ballots cast before the perfunctory unanimous ballot at the end. Although I think it matters because it signals everyone could live with Steve Wood despite the bleeding of online <laughs> catastrophe. Yes. Uh, despite those people on Facebook. Told that the uh, parochial port data is very good, full rebound uh, from COVID in 2023 uh, from the uh, Andrew Gross Communications Report. Uh, we have gained 34 new congregations in 23. And right now they're working on some safeguarding revisions to today, some policy changes, so some minor tidbits here and there. But okay, that confirms our, our thoughts that uh, uh, you know, th there were multiple votes and discussions for who's going to be Archbishop and Steve Wood uh, took it unanimous unanimously at the end. Uh, good for him. So, all right, let me check the story page. Do we have anything else here? We probably do. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about something that's kind of big here in American polity. Um, and you know, we, if you've been offline for five years, you probably don't know that this November there's going to be an election between Trump and Biden. And in presidential history, election history, we have debates. And we had the famous debates between um, Kennedy and Nixon, where Nixon was all sweaty and he lost because he was he looked so nervous. 
Um, and John F. Kennedy was just uh, looked really good for the teleprompters and the, and the cameras, and people fell in love with him. So having a good debate matters. Debates, starting with Hillary Trump, have fallen from that that uh, that glorious rise of what what debate should be, and uh, we have CNN doing the next debate happening this Thursday, two days from now, and they have put out a rule that says they will sue any social media company or YouTube or Anglican TV who provides commentary on the debate. Now, here in America, we have freedom of speech primarily to provide freedom for commentary. And uh, this really kind of bugs me that they want to stop people from giving commentary, George. That's, this is, we're new media, CNN is old media, they're has-beens. Has-beens. I wonder how they could possibly enforce this. I don't I mean, know. Would, would they, are they uh, claiming copyright or... I don't know. I mean, but fair use of copyright allows you to make commentary on items. Yes, it does. I mean, um, you're basically yeah. saying you have uh, legal power over my speech and my opinion, which is ridiculous. Now, <clears throat> in Canada, of course you have legal uh, power over my speech. England, yes. Um, but here in America, we still retain the right to have commentary. And uh, freedom of speech. Maybe not for much longer in Canada. No. Justin Trudeau just got walloped in a by-election. So. Oh really? Wow. Well, what? Huh? So, yeah, there was a by-election uh, mm. for Parliament in Canada, and the Liberals did not do too well. So, yeah. and well, but... and we and actually one of the things that I I am quite excited about the uh, national elections in England because. I like Nigel Farage myself. I find him entertaining. He is fun. And yes. I, th I, th I, I think it'd be neat to see him form a government. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think it'll. It may not happen, but still, it's quite entertaining for me on the sidelines with nothing invested in this other than entertainment value. Yeah, I mean, you and I are certainly historians of news, historians of the church. You're more of a church historian than I'll ever be, um, and. Everything, as I've said before, you know, happens in this little moving left to right, conservative, liberal, Reagan, who was after Reagan or before Jimmy Carter, you know, the, and um, it's fun to watch. We've had it here in America over 200 years watching this pendulum go back and forth. Uh, England the same. All all countries have it, and uh, well, here's here, here's the neat thing about this election. Liz Truss, who was prime minister for only three months, yeah, before she was forced out, gave an interview where bas she basically said the pendulum is not between left and right; it's between the government and the deep state, the establishment, the civil service, the bureaucrats. She blames the church, the Bank of England, for forcing her out of office by basically ginning up a financial crisis just to embarrass her, to force her out of office. And that may be sour grapes, but I think the election we're seeing in the United States is one between the insiders and the outsiders. Oh, well, what absolutely. we're seeing yeah. with Nigel yeah. Farage is between the insiders and the outsiders. So we'll just see. I mean, are the Tories dead? Is Labour dead? Are the Lib Dems dead? Are the Greens die? I mean, who are the insiders and who are the outsiders? So, I mean, we may just see a whole new mix in the political world in the coming weeks. I am not a conspiracy theorist guy at all. I, I, if you delved and questioned me for hours, you'd find I pretty much oppose every conspiracy theory ever created. I, in fact, I know who shot JFK. So, uh, but to watch over the last two and a half years, everything that was a conspiracy from 2020 become no longer a conspiracy is undaunting to my brain. That there's obviously something I'm missing in what I'm what I'm seeing, you know, to 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 see this this uh, disease guy who told us to wear a mask, uh, admit that he lied and made it all up, admit that yeah they funded a lab in in China. I get, well my brain is going I, ow ow no 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 I was told by by media and government that he was telling the truth, and so I just so. That, that's 
That's just me. At the end of a show, in a hot, I'm in my crypt. It's probably 90 degrees in here. It's time to sign off. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 864 of Anglican Unscripted.